Hello, founders. Welcome to startups.com. We are live. Got a great show for you today. We are going to do a massive deep dive into some pitch decks. Before we continue, I want to just encourage you, if you are joining us in the audience right now, you want to type your questions into the Q&A box right now. Just put them in there. I'm going to prioritize making sure that I answer them for you. And you can ask questions about anything, really. It doesn't have to be about pitch decks. It could be about startups in general. And then I'm going to answer them. But if you have questions as I'm moving along, you want to include those in the questions as well. That would be absolutely fantastic. Hope everyone is having an amazing week so far. I am the Chief Strategy Officer here at Startups.com. I am joined off camera by my co-host, Jen. She will be watching and monitoring the chat across all our social medias and answering your questions in terms of getting them organized so that I can address each and every one of them. Before we continue, this episode is brought to you by us. Startups.com, if you have not checked this out, we have a podcast called Startup Therapy. It is done by our chief marketing officer and our chief executive officer, CEO, Will Schroeder and Ryan Rattan. And they sit around and they talk about all the topics that founders don't like to talk about or, you know, might be a little, I'm not going to say taboo, not risque, but not so common in terms of the emotional impact of startups and what happens. And they give you a no BS look. In fact, that's the reason that I came here and joined startups.com. So I want to make sure that all of you check out the startups.com startup therapy podcast. Thank you to everybody that's joining us one more time. Type your questions in the Q&A box. We'll give you regular reminders, and I will make sure that I answer them. We are going to get this ball rolling. We're going to be talking about pitch decks, and I'm going to go through one pitch deck. I'll see how many I can go through. If you are looking for your own pitch deck review, you can send that to me at advisor at startups.com. If you're a member here, I just take a look at your pitch deck, no problem. We'll send you feedback. If you want to have your pitch deck review and you're not a member of startups.com, we just ask you that I get to do it as part of some content as an exchange for doing the pitch deck review. You're going to participate and there is a process there. So just contact us. More than happy to get your pitch deck review. I want to say thank you to all the individuals who send in their pitch decks and just want to encourage all of you. It is takes like courage. It's Tremendously courageous to have your pitch deck reviewed and then talked about here on the social medias. And it's all part of what you are going to be experiencing as a founder. You'd rather bomb and have the feedback come through us here and have us talk about it as I get other people looking at it, than have it where you send it to an investor and then mm, falls flat because you haven't gotten that feedback. You don't know how other people are going to react to it. So what happens is you want to get out of your bubble because you're staring at your pitch decks and you got this whole cognitive bias thing. And most founders, what happens is they start to think their pitch decks are way better than they are. It totally makes sense for them. And then when they're saying it to other people or other people are looking at it, it doesn't make sense. And that's an easy solution that you can take advantage of is just get feedback. And we're going to do that right now. Once again, if you're looking for pitch deck review, let us know. Happy to accommodate it for you. Contact us at advisor at startups.com. Let's take a look at this first pitch deck here. This was sent to us by Dexter. Phone repair and customization with automated AI robotic kiosks. It's a great line, very straightforward. This is going to be more of a brick and mortar, which is totally okay. Hopefully there's some tech involved in there. As we see with AI powered robotic kiosks, that should be interesting. Who hasn't had a need for phone repair in the past? I'd like to see a company name, but hey, it's straightforward. I know what I'm getting into. We're getting right away into the problem statement, which is important. It's great, start off with problem. And it says an estimated 60 to 70%, 4.5 billion of 4.484 billion of smartphone users will experience a cracked screen within their first year purchase. The screen repairs cost consumers over 3.4 billion annually. Additionally, 25%, 1.73 billion of customers delay repairs due to inconvenience of cost for the contributing to the growth of e-waste problem. We have a source. Okay, so this is great because we've got the size, scope, and severity in terms of an attempt to put real numbers. It's better than just saying people don't like getting their phones repaired or phone repair sucks or the phone repair industry is broken or lots of people need phone repairs, but they don't want to get phone repairs. It's better than that. But now we have swung the pendulum so far in the other direction. I'm starting to see this trend a little more. I'm harping a lot on actually putting in numbers and talking about the size, scope, and severity. 
How many people have this problem? What is the scope of this problem? And how severe is the pain or the cost of it if it's not solved? But then I'm watching people just totally flood the pitch deck with all these numbers and you do not have to do that. We can find a happy middle. Let's take a look at what we might want to do here and pull out the most important facts of the problem. Okay, so we have 67% will get a crack in their first year. So 4.15 to 4.84 billion. That's a big market, but is that really the size of the market that is experiencing the pain that you want to be telling investors you're going after? I don't know if you want to do that because you want to be thinking there's lots of Apple care. I've got Apple care. There are warranty issues, etc. So what about the gap? Now let's look at this 25%. I don't know what 25% of the 4.15 billion, but these customers delay phone repairs because of inconvenience or cost. That might be a better place to start and get rid of that 25%. You don't have to put in so many numbers here. What if you just said 1.73 billion phone users delay getting their phones repaired because it's too costly and therefore we contribute to e-waste problem. And I want to know what exactly is this contribution to e-waste? So what are we saying? That how many of these phones end up in landfills or something like that and they don't have to? So that could be the severity of the problem. I'm thinking right now, now I'm just looking at this straight off the cup. I've not looked at this pitch deck before. I'm trying to give you a reaction of what it's like for an investor to look at it. I'm thinking that we are going to just get rid of this and we could say 3.4 billion annually or you could say despite the fact that phone users spend 3.4 billion repairing their phones, 1.73 billion don't get their phones repaired because of the cost contributed e-waste or puts an extra how many tons of waste or something like that into landfills. That might be a better way of focusing here instead of just mashing in all these numbers and drowning the person in all these facts and information. Once again, let me just be super clear here. You want to have the Goldilocks principle. You don't want it too hot. You don't want it too cold. You want it just right, just enough detailed factual information that tells the investor this is the size, scope, and severity of the problem. This is not my opinion alone, but this is an investment opportunity. We have a legitimate problem and it's quantifiable and I'm going to fix it. Let's go with all these people can't get phone repairs because it's too expensive, inconvenient, etc. The solution, AIRR station solves the problem of cracked screens by offering quick, affordable, and automated repairs through AI powered kiosks. This reduces delays and repairs for 1.73 billion users. Lowering costs helps combat the growing e-waste issue. Here we go. First, we've got AI-powered kiosks, and then we've got the issues with phone repair being done by AI immediately incredulous. That's my reaction because I'm thinking about my phone and I go, okay, so I've got a crack in my phone here and I'm going to take it and what am I going to do? Put in a kiosk or something along those lines. And so immediately my spider senses go up. And this is something that founders need to be very cognizant of. There's a certain incredulity if your solution sounds really far-fetched. If you can say, guess what? We can help you lose weight without a diet. Well, that's Ozempic, but immediately they're going to be thinking, what exactly is that? And you you could say it's a new drug that prevents people from getting hungry so they don't have to die to lose weight. You see how that solution works. So you want to make sure that you are not so far out there that now you sound like a founder that's just coming up with a pie in the sky idea. It's not to say pie in the sky ideas are bad, fundamentally bad. I've seen some crazy ideas, but they need to seem feasible and credible, or you're going to have to pad your solution statement and you have to communicate. I know founders that in their minds, Things work really great, but then when they start to explain it, the investor goes, I don't understand what's going on. In fact, there are some people on this call right now on this webinar, and I have looked at your pitch decks, and I didn't get it at first. And that's okay. In your mind, it's like everything works, and in reality, everything works. Now, the burden is on you to communicate it to me in a way that I do understand. But if you've got something that causes me to become a little incredulous, you better get ready to back it up. And right away, I'm seeing that, yeah, sir, you solved the problem, but now I'm going to be expecting how because you haven't given me much. But it's an AI-powered kiosk. All right, let's suspend disbelief for a moment and let's continue. Now you know where my headset's at and my mindset, and you better back it up with the next slide and pow, market opportunity. All right, I'm going to let this fly. Way too much information on here. Tam, total addressable market. Estimated 60, you're saying this over and over again. Just tell me how many cell phones get damaged. And then this is your average screen repair cost, $100. 
And here we go. That's a 10. So this might be a little bit of a value theory, but I'd rather see a top down and say, okay, so if every single person who had a cracked screen went and got your phone repaired by my kiosk, how much am I going to make? That could be your TAM, or you could use a top-down TAM and just say the phone repair industry or the screen repair industry is $3.14 billion. It's either one. So you could say your TAM, total screen repair, repairs is three point, I forget what it was, you know, billion dollars in the entire world. Maybe you could say that. And this is people who need to go pay for their repairs because all these people getting their phones broken, I'm not going to pay for mine because I got Apple Care. I've got the warranties, et cetera, right there. So why would I pay for that? So I am not in your market. My phone doesn't qualify in your market. So you need to readjust that. Now your SAM, serviceable, addressable, available market or addressable market. Focus region, North America, Europe. Now, this is not your SAM. I'm going to warn you right here because just going into a geographic location does not help. Think it through. You need an absolute ironclad. Well, it doesn't have to be ironclad. I'm being hyperbolic here. But you need a battle-tested assumption on how you've calculated your SAM. In this case, I would say the SAM are people who don't have Apple Care, who don't have warranty, and who need to get their phones repaired via a mall or something like that. That might be your SAM. In fact, that's probably your TAM is going to be better. And then your SAM is geographic locations. I'd recommend that. Let's go back here now that I'm thinking through. And mind you, I'm going way overboard. As soon as an investor, warning, as soon as an investor has to do even a fraction of the work that I'm doing to try and help this founder, you've lost them completely. That's the reason you can't leave this a chance. But I'm doing this to try and massage this to say, okay, let's help this founder out and figure out what we could possibly be doing with this Tam Sam song. So let's say the Sam are all the people who cannot go and use their warranties, who need to go to a mall or a kiosk. That would be your Tam times how many phones, which is how much you would charge. And then your serviceable obtainable market, you're gonna target 1% market share. And to me, again, it's fine, but you haven't given me any justification is you think based upon your go-to-market strategy, you can get 1% of them. This is all going to need new math, all right? We're confused here at this moment in time. So let me just repeat. Let's say your TAM are people who need to use repair services, who cannot use warranty or something like that. Then your SAM is going to be people who have access to malls. Maybe that's it, right? Because you're not going to repair every phone that gets broken in the jungle. There's no kiosk there. And then maybe your SOM is a percentage of what you think. You see, that's going to make a lot more sense in terms of a story for investors. Investors are going to say, ah, you can't just spit out facts and numbers and expect the investor to go, oh, gee, this founder really knows what they're talking about. That's the problem with these types of slides that end up just telling me all these references, like I'm going to go research it and look it up. You're not giving me anything to work with that shows me you're a founder that can extrapolate and is thoughtful about your market. Be thoughtful and demonstrate that thoughtfulness for investors. Next, how it works. Customer interaction, AI evaluation, payment processing, automated repair, customization, completion and retrieval, and data collection. Here's where you've lost me. Remember how I said in the beginning, I am now incredulous. I don't believe that I can get my phone repaired in a kiosk. And I'm going to step away for a moment from this solution. If you are a founder out there and you are putting out a solution that people go, that doesn't make sense. Is it even possible? And maybe it is because of your technology and you're giving them a novel insight and you're saying, guess what? Yes, you can lose weight without a diet and exercise, right? Ozempic. Well, then you're going to have to explain to them and back it up in the how it works slide. Address the doubts in the investor's mind. So what are my doubts here? Let's get back to this deck. What are my doubts? How is this even going to work? I'm picturing myself with a crack phone. Here I got my crack phone, right? Crack, crack, crack. And I'm going up to mall kiosk. You're going to have to explain to me how this works. I'm envisioning a world. Let's go into the future, shall we? Let's imagine a world where I go and I put my phone onto the kiosk thing where it's a pad. And then a 3D imaging thing comes out. You've ever seen those, those kiosks, those vending kiosks, where you literally just go in and it scans and then tells you the weight and all this stuff. Like you just basically takes a picture of everything that's going on. Well, maybe that's with the phone or you type it in and you say, I've got an iPhone. What's the newest one? 16, 17, 13, whatever they're on. Mine's a 12. I think I got an iPhone 12. Boop, boop, boop. What is your problem? Screen. And then it, you're supposed to put it on the mat and then it scans, you know, all those things. And then it goes, and then it puts out a little like arm thing. goes, You know, and I'm making all these sound effects for your enjoyment here. You're welcome, YouTube and the internet and everybody at startups.com. Right. And then 
you're supposed to put your phone because it's automatically adjusted the repair center to your phone. So I put it in, put it in there, and then I close the door, and then it goes, it goes to work, type thing, and says, come back in an hour, and your phone. I don't know. Maybe that works. And then all these little robots go in and basically disassemble your phone because, remember, I got to take off my case. I have no idea how you're going to – how do you know if my crack is repairable or not? Maybe it's got a scan, diagnose. I've seen that. But you're going to have to explain that to me. So in this case – I'm literally going to need a step-by-step schematic on how this whole thing works. Think of it this way. You ever been to a grocery store and these days you got self-checkout? Well, it's genius because I always said to myself, if I was an investor and someone pitched me, we can basically do self-checkout machines. I would say to myself, how is it that you don't steal? I'm just thinking because I don't know the technology. I'm not an innovator in that way. Well, you go to a grocery store now and they've got these big things where you have to put your groceries on there and you start off here and then it knows what you're scanning and how much it should weigh and it calculates it so you can't get away with stuff, right? And then it actually gets rid of the barcode and all those things like you don't, it doesn't like beep and squawk and things like that. Let's think about that for a moment. And then you have to have people watching it because I could just be sneaking stuff around there. It was to the point where I went to a grocery store, I'm telling this story for a point, stick with me everybody. I go to a grocery store And I put my little book and everything onto that tablet that weighs everything. And I'm trying to get the whole thing to work and it's not starting. And I'm really frustrated. And then the attendant, the person, the staff comes and says, it's not going to work if you got your bloody stuff on the thing that weighs everything. And I went, oh my goodness, that makes total sense. And I realized this is a great piece of technology. And so now one person can watch and make sure that everybody's loading their stuff to the machine and the machine is measuring and making sure that you're honest. So you're not punching in, I've got one thing, but I'm buying like 10 of them, etc. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not. I've been in kiosks where, again, it just scans it. Here's the thing, you're gonna have to explain that to me as an investor. And that's how it works because I can't fathom it. And so if you've got some secret insight as to how it works, some of you, if you're working on that deep tech and you're making a promise, you're going to have to explain to them, here's how it works in your how it works slide. And this slide does not do it. Customer interaction. Okay, I approached the kiosk. Great. What makes that different than everything else? Is there a person standing there? Is there a machine? AI assesses the condition. How? You drop it in where? You scan it, you type it in, et cetera. How does it recognize? Is it attached to a big database? Payment processing. Okay, that doesn't matter. I'm not even at payment processing yet. Automated repair customization. The kiosk performs repair using robotic technology. What is that? What does that look like? Just don't tell me there's a promise there. Have you developed a new machine? Because guess what? If this machine actually exists and can repair a cell phone, we're talking about all those factories where people are hand making stuff Robots are probably doing it anyway, but this is going to revolutionize manufacturing the way that it is because if you can take something apart, well, guess what? You can put it back together. So now we've got this issue, data collection. So as it stands right now, this slide is not going to do it. I need something that looks literally like a step-by-step with pictures. Here's how it works, and it goes one, two, three, four, five. How long do the robots take? Does everybody have to wait behind you, et cetera? Can you watch it? Is there like a little fishbowl that you see what's going on? Schematics are going to be important, but if you got this robot, that's a killer application. I like it. Pre-seed traction team combines over 20 years of experience, technology, innovation. Means nothing to me, okay? 20 years of technology, what? Partnership with Microtron AI, secure partnership for advanced AI integration in our kiosk. What is that partnership? Let me just say this. I'm super annoyed. And I understand the reason you're doing it because you're trying to present things forward. But fudging a partnership. I saw a pitch deck the other day and it said, we now have a partnership with OpenAI. Okay, OpenAI, biggest game in town. Fantastic. Did Sam Altman sign that partnership himself? Did you negotiate it out? Is it a one-off, completely bespoke, signed in blood, hermetically sealed? What kind of partnership is it? Or is it one of those things where you go in and you fill out a form and you get approved to be an open AI partner, a value added service provider or something like that. It could be all those things. So you clearly want to define it because right now I know what this founder is doing. You're stretching into territory, which is creating more incredulousness. Yeah, that's the word incredulousness. I don't believe you. You're throwing around these words and you're not defining it. You want to be super clear. Launch a landing page for beta demonstrations. All right. Robotic manufacturer partnership in the process of securing partnership for robotic. Okay. So now we've got a big issue. If you are a technology company, you better be ready 
to build technology. If you are a software company, you better be ready to build software. Here is what goes through my mind. You come to me and you say, I need money to build this thing. And I say to you, great, how are you gonna build it? And you tell me, I have to go take your money, Mr. Investor or Mrs. Investor. I'm gonna take your money and I'm going to go and pay another company that's outside of me, not in my control. Case in point, everyone. We just had a founder talk about legally I spent all this money and this app developer did not come through and now I'm in a legal battle with them. How it works. And if you're not a technical team, you're gonna have a harder time raising investment. Unless, let me caveat this, unless. Because I am a non-technical founder that has started software companies and I've sold software companies and I've raised investment for those companies. Why? Because I proved that I could make money and I've proven that I use a dev shop, but I got my own internal technical talent. CTO comes in, use the third party developer, but the CTO can take over at any point in time. Why? They're probably working a job, different things like that. And I've proven that I can make money and an investor gonna ask you, did you build your own stuff? And if you say no, they're gonna ask you, do you own it? Well, not really, because I haven't paid the final bill and I need investment dollars and I need investors come in, bail me out so I can pay for it. There's no way an investor is gonna take that bet ever because there's so much that could go wrong. What prevents that dev shop or that robotics manufacturer or whatever engineering firm from taking your stuff, stealing it, happens all the time. What assurances do I have? What prevents them from being mad at you because you can't pay your bills? And now I've invested money and all that money's gone because it's gone to this black hole because you've got some developers, you got some technical people holding you over a barrel. Think about it from an investor standpoint. Would you invest in a company like that who didn't have the ability to control their own manufacturing, their own building? Now I get it. Sometimes you need those relationships with the manufacturer, but show that there is safety in that. So if you're using a manufacturer, just say, I use the manufacturer because we've got 10 manufacturers that could do it for me. And guess what? I just secured the best deal because I'm gonna use their stuff and I'm going to monetize it and do it in a way that they're not going to do it. They don't understand how to do it. If you're taking a technology that already is a whiz banger and all you're doing is you're making money off of it, you're not a good investment. Why? Because what stops them from them raising their own money and going to do it? And you say, no, no, Ed, I've secured the rights to the patents and exclusivity. Doesn't matter. Because as soon as you start the fight and your case gets locked up in court for a year, two years, maybe a decade, all investors have lost their money. That's how it works. But if you can say, yes, I've got an agreement, but I've got a fail safe that if it doesn't work, we've got multiple. In fact, we're planning on using multiple manufacturers so we don't have a single point of failure so that we can scale. That's what you wanna do. You can say, but we're using this manufacturer right now and their stuff to prove out our concept and to start making money, but we're covered, we're good, we're doing things that they never would. That's a great story for investors. The founders that go out and raise money just to use something that's already been patented or technology that's owned, like founders that go out and they secure the rights from a university, that is a very delicate stuff. Unless you got those people who participate in creating the patent, who are participating in your startup, that makes me really nervous. Because what stops you from losing that relationship that point of failure, that's very scary. And now you have no defensibility in your startup. So this is not gonna work. You're gonna have to show better traction than that in the sense that you've got the designs up, you got people. I wanna see experts now tell me, yes, this is possible. Not that you got a partnership. Of course, a robotics manufacturer is gonna say, we'll partner with you if you can come up with the money and we'll build your stuff. Of course, they're gonna extend you a partnership agreement, right? Who wouldn't? I would, but I wouldn't take it seriously until the money is right there in front of me. Next, business model, revenue streams. Kiosk leasing, it's not a revenue stream, by the way. We offer annual lease in our kiosk to retail franchises under profit share agreement. Okay, if you're saying we will allow someone to get our kiosk and put it there. Okay, that's fine. Kiosk placement, place our kiosks in shopping malls and airports, service fees, each repair, customization. Okay, I'm just gonna say for every phone repaired, we're gonna charge this amount or we're gonna charge the person owning the kiosk a certain amount of dollars and they're gonna make it. Business model is fine. I'd like to see how much it's gonna be important. Battle test your assumptions in terms of what you're charging. Competitive analysis. We got the air station. Quality. What dimension is quality? Of course everyone's gonna promise quality. It's like going to a restaurant saying, all right, imagine, and I'm being facetious here to really prove the point. Imagine you're pitching a restaurant, right? You've got a restaurant. And the investor says, okay, have you done your competitive analysis? And you say, okay, so I'm pitching a Mexican restaurant. I really love Mexican food. Really hard to get good Mexican food here in Canada, all right? Obviously, you can get poutine, you can get maple syrup, you can get Canadian back bacon, but you can't get good Mexican food. I can't stand it. I love going down south. I digress. 
But say I'm opening a Mexican food restaurant and someone says, what's your competitive advantage? What's your differentiator? And I go, we've got good food. Think about that for a moment, okay? Just think about it. what do you think the investor is going to do in terms of response? How are they going to respond to you? Are they going to take you seriously whatsoever, right? We're going to have service, good service, quality service. When people come to me and they say, my competitive advantage is I've got better customer service, I go, that's great. That might totally be true. You might have the best customer service in the world, but unless you either show me the data or you tell me exactly how you do customer service better than everyone else, we have 24 hour customer service. Great. Okay. How did you get that done? Because I know so many other companies that would love to have 24 hour customer service. So if you're doing competitive analysis, you need to differentiate yourself and using these generic dimensions, such as quality price, everyone has a price, right? Like, Tell me the price. We are 10% lower. You have to battle test. Repair time. Everyone's got repair times. Convenience. This is not cutting it. This is not a well-researched competitive analysis. On top of which, the only competitive analysis that you could do is traditional phone repairs as well as what people are doing right now. So warranty. This competitive analysis that I want to see, if you got some robots, you got some special kiosks, let's take the robots out of, out of it, for example. Like unmanned. That's your differentiator right there. It's like everybody else, someone has to touch the phone and repair. Ours doesn't. Bang, done. Write the check. We're going home. If you can prove that, we're done. You don't have to say anything more. But let's just say you don't have robots. And for the sake of the other founders, looking at these pitch decks, they have to go in and differentiate themselves in a little bit of a different way. You want to talk about what people are doing in their current state of the market because they don't know your solution exists. Case in point here, they go and they have to use warranty. How long does that take? Well, they paid for it and it takes 10 business days. Okay, great. Whereas ours takes hours. Great, that's a 100x solution right away. See how that works. Or you gotta go to a mall and you gotta go in there and then you're gonna pay $200 for repair and it's gonna take you two days. Ours, you pay $100 because we don't have labor in it. It infinitely scales as well as blah, 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 right? Now, something else just popped in my mind. What if your robot breaks the phone? Those are risks that we have to talk about, and you better put those and address those. Again, goes back to the robot being way better than everybody else. But if you're going to do a competitive analysis and you've got something completely unique and new, make sure you include the competitors would be used if your solution was not available or is the old school way of doing things. Let's move to team. See this major problem here. Look at this wall of text that's happening. I can't even read this and bullet points, everyone, bullet points and logos. This is your team, bullet points and logos. Let me talk about team slides for a moment. If there are so many founders trying to solve the same problem, how I'm going to differentiate on whether I believe your team can pull it off is the team bio slide. And you better present it in such a way that people go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. The more competitive your startup market is, the more people are going to look on your team. The less traction your startup has, if you're pre-seed, the more people are going to look at your team. I will give you an example of this. Y Combinator. Hopefully we can re-record this because I did an interview with someone who's been to Y Combinator twice, has gone and raised over $150 million for each venture, scaled that to over $300 million in revenue, will probably go public, get acquired, all these things. Twice, okay? Been to Y Combinator, loved it, went through the second time. You didn't have to do it the second time because once you go through once, you're going to be funded, all this stuff. So he goes through it again. And he says, Ed, there are two ways to get into Y Combinator. Yeah, they have to have an amazing team, an exceptional team to have an idea get accepted pre-seed, right? Before revenue, anything like that. Or you have to have major traction. If you don't have an exceptional team, Nobel Prize winning, astronaut landed on the moon, Hollywood, Taylor Swift type team, that people go, holy shit, I need to invest. Like if Jeff Bezos came out of retirement and he said, I got an idea for a startup, I'm just going to raise money. And all he did was he just said, I have an idea for a startup. He didn't even tell you what the startup was. You know how many people are going to write him checks? Everybody's going to write him a check. They're going to say, I don't care what that idea is. Put me on the cap table. Thanks. Have a, have a go at it. I don't even need updates. Anything. I need to interview you. I don't need to see a pitch deck, anything like that. Here's my money. Take my money. That's how Elon Musk raised $6 billion for his XAI, right? The thing doesn't even make any revenue, but it's Elon Musk. What are you gonna what are you gonna do? You're gonna make that bet every single time. But if you don't have that level and you're a founder like a normie like me, right? I'm a seven time founder founder, two X's, I still don't have enough of a resume for someone to write me a check blind because I don't have a massive IPO, anything like that. I I've worked with startups and they are unicorns, all right, all around the world. I have worked with Alibaba is one of the startups that I work with. I still don't have the pedigree 
for someone to write a check. It helps, right? And I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to show all the pictures of me standing in front of all these massive unicorn Chinese companies, et cetera. And I'm going to share, this is what I've done. And that definitely moves the needle. But now I need more traction. This is an important lesson is that put your founding team front and center and share the best. But if you don't have the domain expertise, you don't have things to brag about, you're going to have to get traction. I'm sorry to rain on the parade, right? To pee on the party, whatever euphemism, whatever metaphor that you want to use, but that's the reality. Go to market strategy. All right, let's take a look at this. Launch strategy. We plan to launch initially a high traffic retail location. Of course, that's a given. How, right? How? What have you set up? What is the actual strategy in this? I just hear this is what you're going to do at launch. Partnership. Strategic partnerships. With whom? Who are you going to do partnerships with? Marketing channels. Which marketing channels? How have you developed your social media? How are you going to do it? You're going to use influencers. Exactly why would your market respond? Customer acquisition. Well, that's what this is all about. We will leverage social media influencers. Same thing as marketing channels. In-store promotional loyalty program. So now what you've done is you have presented to me a go-to-market strategy that's just throwing a laundry list on the wall and you're saying, I'm going to throw all the spaghetti on the wall and I'm going to see what sticks. That's not going to cut it. Not going to cut it. You have to be thoughtful and present to the investor, I've thought through the marketing strategy. Because if you say, oh, we're going to use Facebook ads, investor is going to say, yeah, you and every other competitor you've got is going to use Facebook ads. What makes you different? And that's the reason startups that go out and say, we acquire by paid advertising, investors don't trust that. They need to hear the hack. They need to understand what's the difference. What is going on here? The founder that's gone on, and I know founders right now, they're building social media audiences. They're working hard, putting out content, and they have like 7,000, 10,000 loyal social media followers. Now that's a strategy, right? You go to an investor and say, I spent the last two years building up a following on social media. Here are my metrics. Here are my, me, how many views on my videos I got. Here are my testimonials. Here's all my ratings. And this is a dedicated audience. I'm going to launch my product through them first. And then they're going to share it with other people. First step, Bob's your uncle. This is really great. That's a go-to-market strategy that I would believe in. Let me give you another case in point. I'm going to tell you a story here, okay? All you founders who are watching this, going to be watching this recording, sit back for a moment. Let me give you some story time. I have a startup. It's a gaming startup. It started off as an NFT, sort of blockchain-y video game startup back when things were huge. And I was looking into it, and I kept hitting the wall. I couldn't get initial traction or found the ways to get initial traction. I started marketing my startup, this gaming startup, for kids. I was going to take on the Pokemon Magic the Gathering world by storm. I was going to disrupt. I went and got idea validation and it did customer discovery. Idea validation. I showed it to someone who was a grandmaster of Magic the Gathering, like tournament, like the guy who makes money playing Magic the Gathering. I thought, okay, this guy's going to know it, right? I go through all my contacts and I say, hey, help me. And someone introduces me. And he says to me, you can't sell this game to kids. You're going to get thrown in jail. I was like, really? Why? He said, because you've got gambling mechanics in your game. And I do. You got wagering mechanics and you use poker chips and everything like that. And I thought, didn't even think about it, right? So he says, you can't do it. But he said this. He said, but if your game was played in a casino, I'd totally play it. And I said, wow, that's validation. He likes my game, but he poo-pooed my go-to-market strategy of working through kids and families, like 12 to 16-year-olds, et cetera. I go, okay, 18 plus. So I'm going to lean on that. So I got a little bit of data. Then I start going and I start playing around in forums. Reddit is an amazing spot. But if you can find forums where people want to talk, I go to a, uh, a forum, right? A website called Game Geek. And I start participating and I start talking. I start talking about my game. And it's crickets. Nobody's responding to me. It's like I'm a pariah. I'm like, do I need to work hard, pay for stuff? I was thinking about paying. I was thinking about contacting. And I just literally asked, what's the deal here? How come I'm not getting a response? One guy comes to me and he says, remember, I was going to use this channel for go-to-market strategy. One guy comes to me and he says, Ed, we don't like your type of game here. And I was like, what? There are types of games? And he said to me, we don't like your type of game because it's a pay-to-win and our group, our whole community likes board games that are like fair and all these things. And so the whole Magic the Gathering crowd is going to be different. I was like, I didn't know. I didn't know. So I started <laughs> researching all this stuff. Every step of the way, I was getting invalidated, but I was getting validated in another direction. Then I keep going. And I'm sitting on this startup for years, everyone. This is not a main part of my portfolio. This is like a passion project that I did. Because really, market timing, all that stuff, I'm not in a hurry. And if it never works, I played this game tons of times. Jen's on the call. She's played the games with me. We've had communities out. We have people come like Poker Nights pretty much come and play the game. It's a lot of fun. And if it ended up there, it's great. But if I could go raise a million dollars, $5 million, I could take it to the next level. That'd be something fun, right? I'm sitting around and I'm thinking through, and then I come across this marketing channel 
called Lit RPG. What is Lit RPG, Ed? I'm glad that you asked, children. I will tell you. Lit RPG is like reading someone playing a video game, a role-playing video game. So imagine you're playing Elden Ring. All right, I don't play these games. World of Warcraft, a huge World of Warcraft fan. But instead of playing the game and watching all your stats on the screen, you're reading the novel and all the stats are written there and you're reading someone actually living inside the game or playing the game and you're reading about it. That's Lit RPG. And I thought that was the dumbest thing in the world until I saw the stats and I saw how addictive type of media is. It's new, it's taking the publishing world by storm. Well then, I jump in. I go, I need to validate this. I started reading Lit RPG and it's like crack. For people who don't have time for video games, who still want to read books, and it's like, I don't want to play the games, go out there. Perfect for someone like me. I get to live vicariously by reading this. And then I start listening to audiobooks, and my word is entertaining. It is literally like playing a video game. I can listen to these audiobooks while I'm going to the gym, and I thought this is amazing. Then the, all the worlds came together, and I said, what if I used Lit RPG to create a story around my world get initial audience and get fans, and then sell them on the game after. And I will put the game, like Jumanji. You seen the movie Jumanji? Okay, I'm acting like you can all respond to me. I'm sure all of you have heard the movie Jumanji. It was an actual board game. What if the board game Jumanji actually went for sale after someone watched the movie with The Rock and Kevin Hart and everybody, Jack Black and Karen Gillum, I think it is, go in there and have all those different adventures. And then you actually play the board game Jumanji. I'm sure it's a thing. You can actually buy Jumanji. And I thought, this is a great way to launch my product. So what did I do? I went and I started writing. I became a fantasy author, not because I want to be, in fact, I do enjoy it. It's great stress relief, but I'm doing it for my marketing strategy through years and years of research and testing. I've tried all sorts of other ways, invested thousands of dollars each time I've taken a crack at it and been invalidated, right? I'm my own investor, which is great. Fun way to bootstrap. Well, now this starts taking off and now I'm trying to bring the world together. And guess what I'm gonna tell investors? I'm gonna say, I figure out a hack that nobody else is doing. I'm writing a novel and look at my community and they're learning to play the game without actually me having to sell the game because talk about the game. And every time I release something, I put in pictures of the game and I share it and all this stuff. I even use the game to write the novel. I even use the game, I start using it and I start playing it and I create a world around it and a story. That's a story that I think investors are gonna want to listen to. Now I could be completely wrong, but I can guarantee you this. I went on Reddit and I said, can anybody tell me if anybody else is doing this, any other publisher, any other developer, nobody's doing it. I've got something unique and novel and it's out there working for me right now and I'm testing the paid advertising, I'm testing all those things. It is a cohesive strategy. It is not a slide like this. And I understand the founder, you're learning how to do this. First time founder, new founder. This is not the page that you wanna see. Investors wanna see a well thought through cohesive strategy. Okay, funding asks, we are seeking $500,000 in pre-seed funding. Funds will be allocated developing kiosks, 40% marketing, hiring key personnel, and initiating our pilot program, shopping malls. We've missed the boat here because now this is the final test. The final test is when you ask me for money and when you explain to me what that money is going to be used for. This is the final test. I may love you as a founder. I may love the idea, but if you are so far out to lunch, Case in point, founder tells me, uh, and I had to tell a founder, no, I'm not going to help you fundraise because of your issue right here. Founder comes to me and says, me and my partner, and this has been multiple times, we need to make X amount of dollars and it's in the millions. And I said, that's a deal breaker, done. I'm not gonna do that. There's no way that an investor is gonna take us seriously. You gotta have the best idea in the world. It's not gonna happen. A founder is not going to put good money chasing after bad money. It's not going to happen. So if you come and you got a use of funds that's completely out to lunch or is unrealistic, and this is the case here, founder, Dexter, I believe is the name. You have to develop these robots. You're telling me that you're going to spend $500,000 to develop robots that fix smartphones? You didn't even include that in your use of funds. Do you know how expensive mall kiosks are? Do you have any idea whatsoever? Believe me, I've owned two mall kiosks, right? I have been a entrepreneur owning franchises in malls. I know the cost of it. I did a mall kiosk when I was in high school. I was a young entrepreneur. Expensive. What you have demonstrated for me is that you have not done the research and you don't know your unit economic. And to me, that doesn't matter if you have the greatest thing in the world. That to me says a lot about you as a founder. So make sure that you understand your financials and you are financially savvy and you know what goes into running a business. You don't have to be the one who has all the accounting skills and you don't have to be a CPA. You don't have to be a CFO, but you need to understand 
how your business works, and you need to understand how to do projections and cost things out. But Ed, I can get a CFO to do that. No, you can't. CFO's not going to come on board to help you with these things. On top of which, if a CFO did that for you and you didn't know what your CFO was talking about, that's another massive liability, what it boils down to. In this case, let me end with this. I appreciate what you're trying to do. Big swings, big vision. If you could create a robot that fixes cell phones, you can create a robot that fixes everything, but you have to create it. I'd rather see advisors on your board that are able to do that. I would go back and retool this, and maybe you're going to license robots or license technology, or maybe you got a better way to fix cell phones in the beginning. Do a tier step. I know these kiosks, they go in and I watch them, you know, put new screens or screen protectors on the phone, you know, et cetera. And maybe you've got like a real cool kit that fixes phones or something like that that makes it a lot easier, like a little doohickey, and you license out to these phone repair shops. I don't even know how well these phone repair shops are doing, by the way, right? So I'd like to do some research if I was an investor. Maybe you need to step it up and you need to disrupt the industry a little bit that way with an existing thing that's not going to cost you millions of dollars to develop robots, something along those lines. Maybe you create a software for cell phone repairs, or maybe you've got the Uber of cell phone repairs. I just had a technician do a warranty or a recall repair on my car, and I called them thinking I had to spend a whole day dropping it off, finding some place to go, doing some stuff. And you know what they said to me? They said, Ed, this can be done with a mobile technician will come right to your home. I was like, this is absolutely amazing, right? New technology. And he shows up and he's got the whole kit and all these things. Absolutely fantastic. That's an innovation. Do that for cell phones or something along those lines. Do that and then move into robots, corner the market, have all these stores out there and say, now we're going to develop robots as we figure this out because we've repaired like a million smartphones and we know how to do it. That's what I would suggest to you. I appreciate the big moonshot vision, but your team and you as a founder, you have not given us anything in this pitch deck and don't be discouraged. Many times you have to go back to the drawing board. You're not giving me anything to give me confidence that you're the one to pull it off. And if I wrote you a check, even if I wrote you a $10,000, $20,000 check, or the $500,000 check, I believe that money will be gone. I'm not going to make that money in return based on what I see with this pitch deck. And on top of which, this pitch deck is not compelling enough for me to even call you and have a conversation. And this is what these pitch decks are meant to do. Go back to the drawing board. In this case, I would send you back to idea validation. If you're here with us at startups.com, you're in this position, we have something called the idea validation bootcamp. Go through that, get your idea validated, and then start thinking about pre-seed funding. Don't raise pre-seed funding before you do idea validation. There you have it. That's it for this one. Every week, I'm going to do pitch deck review, a deep dive. This goes deeper. Like spending an hour on a pitch deck is unheard of on how you'd go about doing it. I appreciate all the founders that have been hanging out. I see many people who keep coming back to learn and learn and learn. That's going to be great. This stuff is going to be put out on YouTube. If you are seeing this on the YouTubes, please like, comment, subscribe. We are here every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And consider joining our fabulous community here at Starts.com. If you're here with us already, thank you so much for your support. Jen, thanks for being my co-pilot as always. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks, everyone.